Last time that I spoke, back in May, we discussed alleged historical errors in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. I had intended originally to do all four Gospels in one sitting, as it were, and it was too much material. So we went through ten alleged historical errors in Matthew and Mark. We're going to go through nine in Luke and John, and then we'll stop and we'll do a little retrospective and ask ourselves, what conclusions should we draw from what we've seen? My verse that I'm using as an epigraph for this talk tonight is the same as the one that I used for the previous talk, Proverbs 18, 17, and for good reason. The one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. The critics of the Gospels have had their chance. They have spoken. And frankly, to a lot of people, they seem right. It seems like they've got reason and evidence on their side. Our job tonight is to come and examine that and to see whether it stands up to searching historical inquiry. I like to use a little map of the material, and I've used this in some previous talks, breaking it down into external versus internal evidence, and then across in the other direction, positive evidence and objections. We've done positive external evidence in one of the earlier talks. We've done positive internal evidence in another one of those talks. And then we're here tonight, still here, like we were last time, talking about alleged historical errors in the Gospels. Our goals this evening are to understand the challenges posed by the claim that Luke and John make repeated significant historical errors, to examine from a historical point of view several of the most common historical objections raised against them, and having done that, to assess the case for the genuineness and substantial historicity of the Gospels in the light of our investigation. We are not going to talk this evening about various alleged discrepancies and contradictions among the Gospels. Tonight we're concerned with alleged mismatches between the Gospels and external sources of information. We will talk about alleged contradictions. In fact, if my guess is right, that'll probably fill up more than one talk. So we'll have plenty of time to talk about those and lay out a whole bunch of those and look at them carefully. So if you don't hear me doing that tonight, the reason is not that I'm afraid of them or that I have nothing to say about it. It's that I have too much to say about it that's reserved for another talk. So come back for the next one or two or three if that was what you were interested in. Uh, Just before I lay out the case against Luke, which we will then examine, let me ask you a question. How is it that an ordinary Christian with an ordinary background, not a scholar, not someone learned in Greek and in Hebrew, not someone steeped in Greek and Roman and Jewish history, just normal person in the pew with a nine-to-five job can be reasonably assured that what he reads in the Gospels is at least substantially historically accurate. This is a question that's got many answers. One answer might be the internal witness of the Holy Spirit in his heart. But what if we're talking about somebody who's sitting in the pew and is harboring doubts, maybe isn't a Christian, maybe is doubting his profession of faith, and doesn't feel any internal witness? What then? Well, we could try to make a theological argument for the inspiration of Scripture and for the correctness of these things from that. But what if his doubts extend to the very kinds of things we would use as reasons. Well, he could look up to a pastor, a scholar, someone else who does have the appropriate credentials and could say, well, that guy's done the research. I trust him. And that might be a very good answer. But I think there's another way to do it. And here's what it is. You can be confident that these works are substantially accurate if people have tried their best to refute them and have failed, have gone searching through, leaving no stone unturned, trying to come up with some semblance of an objection here and there and everywhere, and it turns out that they have not been able to do it. In that respect, 
the critics and the enemies of Christianity have given us some of the best evidence for its truth. They've done their worst. If their worst doesn't get the job done, then you know that everything that learning and malice can provide by way of a criticism of the Gospels has failed to put a dent in them. We're not entitled to say that until we look at the objections squarely. So let's do that. Here's an outline of the case against Luke. First point up, and this is the most popular objection to Luke, you cannot enter the words Luke and census into a search engine on the internet without having this objection jump up in your face. Here it is. According to Luke, Caesar Augustus ordered a taxation of the whole Roman Empire during the reign of Herod the Great, but Augustus never did this, and he could not have ordered a census just in Herod's domain. Number two, related to that, Luke confuses this supposed census with one under Quirinius, a real one, that took place about 12 years later. Luke's a decade or more off time-wise. That would be a pretty substantial miss. I think you'd get it that marked wrong on a history exam if you missed it by 10 or 12 years. Number three, Luke gives Pontius Pilate the wrong title, calling him the procurator. Luke's term is actually hegemon. We'll talk about that more. Instead of prefect, which is the term he should have given him. So Luke doesn't know the right words. But there's more. Luke claims that Lysanias was alive in about the year 27. But in fact, Lysanias died around the year 36 to 34 B.C., He's 60 years off. That one's definitely getting marked off on the history exam. Objection number five. Luke speaks of Annas and Caiaphas as high priests, but there was only ever one high priest at a time. Luke hadn't apparently read the Old Testament. Didn't he know that there was only one high priest? Blunder. Luke doesn't know what he's talking about. Number six. Luke places a synagogue at Capernaum, but there was no synagogue there in Jesus' time. Ouch. That would be a problem. And objection number seven, Luke is confused about the geographical locations of Galilee, Samaria, and Judea. And those are pretty basic geographical units. If you don't get those right, you don't really know what's going on. So there's a thumbnail sketch of the case against Luke. It sounds good, doesn't it? If you're sitting in a classroom in a comparative religion course and somebody says, well, now I just want to explain to you why we can't take these to be trustworthy historical documents and rattles off a bunch of things like this and maybe the ten other objections that we looked at last time, you could easily come away thinking, well, that sounds like a plausible case against the Gospels. Okay, let's look at those one by one. Objection number one, Luke 2 verse 1 says, in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. In the King James Version, it says all the world should be taxed. We'll have to talk about the term that's used there. In the NIV, it says the entire Roman world. Where'd that word Roman come from? We'll talk about that too. Here's the objection. Caesar Augustus never ordered all the world or all the Roman world to be registered. That just didn't happen. Let's look at it. What this verse says is that the whole oikumene, the whole land, was to be registered. And Luke uses this word in the book of Acts as well, in almost the same construction. There's someone who prophesies that there would be a great famine over all of the, and then we get this Greek word oikumene. But in that context, it clearly means not the whole globe, not the whole Roman world, but the land of Judea. And we know that it means that because Luke tells us about the relief efforts for the Christians in Judea during that time. And those relief efforts are made by believers who live outside of Judea. They're sending money there to help. So this is clearly a term that can have a more restricted meaning like that. And in fact, in Luke does have such a meaning. But maybe somebody could press that. Judea was under the control of Herod the Great. And he was a client king in good standing. So he would have been allowed to levy taxes himself. The emperor would not have issued this degree because the emperor didn't do that for client kings in good standing. So there's still a problem. Ah, but was he in good standing? 
we need to go to our friend, the Jewish historian Josephus here. Near the end of his reign, according to Josephus, Herod fell out of favor with Augustus. And Augustus was so angry with him, it all had to do with a war that Herod got into with some people over on the eastern side of his realm. And the emperor got half of the story, not the whole story. And the half that he heard made him very angry with Herod the Great. And so he said, whereas he had treated him before as his friend, he would, would from that point on treat him as his subject. A letter like that coming from the emperor was not a happy occasion. Formally or in effect, this means you're demoted. You had been Rex Socius. You had been an ally. Now you are Rex Amicus, which is a step down. You're more like my pet dog, not like my ally. And one of the differences between Rex Socius and Rex Amicus is that he would lose the authority, which always existed only at Caesar's will anyway, Caesar's good pleasure. You lose the authority to collect your own taxes. This is a problem because nobody likes paying taxes. Wait, well, maybe I should do a check. How many of you just love it? Okay, right. Nobody loves paying taxes. And so the trick, if you want to keep political order, is to take the revenues in the way that is least offensive to the people you're governing. If you're on the spot, you can manage that to some extent. If you are coming in from Rome for the purpose of getting the money, you probably don't know much about lo local customs and you probably don't care much about them. You're just going to grab the money and that's going to cause unrest. And who's going to have to live with that when you go back to Rome with the money? Whoever was the rex amicus in charge. Now, from Josephus, we learn something else interesting. Josephus doesn't tell us directly that there was an enrollment. He does, however, mention that there was an oath of allegiance to Caesar required from citizens in Herod's domain. In fact, several thousand Pharisees got in trouble because they wouldn't sign it. So there was a formal oath of allegiance, and a bunch of people said, we're not going to do that, and they got in trouble for it, and they were fined, and someone paid their fine for them, and that was considered to be a great boon to pay the fine for these noble folks who wouldn't swear the oath of allegiance. But that would have been an aspect of the reduction of the status of Judea. However, Herod the Great had not been the ruler of Judea for this long for nothing. He was a sharp guy, cruel, uh, paranoid, but canny, sly like a fox. He managed to find a way to get the emperor to hear his side of the story. He sent an embassy to the emperor. They were sent home without even being admitted to the emperor's presence. He sent another one. They were turned back and sent home. He, the emperor wouldn't take any gifts from him. He wouldn't listen to anybody. But he sent a third guy who tried to plead his case. And this guy was a little bit better at it. When he stood up to speak, Augustus stopped him and he said, I just want to know one thing. Is it true that Herod the Great committed these atrocities I've heard of. And this very clever amb ambassador on Herod the Great's behalf said, it's partly true and it's partly false. You've been given only some of the story and the representations that you've been given are all the unfavorable parts, but you haven't been given the context for the setting of those things. And that time, Augustus willing to find out if he'd really only been given half the story, listened, and he was persuaded, and Herod was back in his good graces. Now, what happens if you're out of favor with the emperor, and he starts the process of reducing the level of your dominion to the level of something where he comes in and does the taxing, and then you get back in his good favor? What happens? Ideally, the process is tabled and you don't have to have that carried through. So the answer to objection number one is, the registration was probably only in Herod's dominion, not empire-wide. It may well have been ordered when Herod fell out of favor with Augustus. That would be around the year 7 BC. Our best data suggests that Jesus was born in 6 to 5 BC, right in that zone. And that explanation also explains the oath of loyalty to Caesar that Josephus mentions, with, without that explanation, 
That's totally unexplained. We have no idea why anybody would be asked to do that with this explanation we do. But objection number two picks right up on this, and this is the one that most people think is the killer. Luke says, this was, or at least this is our translations read. I'm quoting from the English Standard Version, the ESV here. Translations vary. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. I'm not using the NIV. One of the reasons I don't like to use the NIV, although it's a very readable translation and, and people love it for that reason, they tend to add words that aren't there in the original. It's an interpretive translation, so what you're getting isn't just a translation of the words. It's an attempt to tell you what the translators think was meant in a fuller sense. For example, in the previous verse, the NIV inserts the word Roman, the whole world, the whole Roman world. The word Roman isn't there in any text whatsoever. They think they're doing you a favor by supplying it. It's just not there. And of course, in this case, I think that gives an actual misimpression of what's going on. But in verse 2 here, the way the ESV translates it, it sounds like it's saying all of this stuff happened, this decree happened when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Here's the problem. Quirinius didn't become governor of Syria until the year 6 AD. This is 10 years, 10 years after Herod the Great was dead. He died in 4 BC. So how can a chronological blunder of 10 or 12 years just be explained? This, is, this looks like a mistake. Now, let's stop and let's just look at this coldly from the point of view of an historian. Forget that you're dealing with a text that has been held to be sacred. Set aside anything about inspiration. Suppose for the sake of the argument that Luke goofed. Suppose for the sake of the argument that he got his wires crossed and associated the birth of Jesus with something that happened 10 to 12 years later. That would not mean that he's totally incompetent with respect to everything else. It would just mean that in this one case, he had made an error. If he gets a lot of other things right, you might still say, eh, he could still be a decent historian, so he made a mistake here. So this one wouldn't kill it, but it is a bit of an embarrassment. Let's see what can be said about it. Before we answer it, we need to take a look at two other things about Luke. First of all, Luke knows Jesus was born during the reign of Herod the Great. He starts out right after his prologue in his gospel talking about this. He's talking about the birth of John, who was, of course, born just months before Jesus was born. So he knows that this is all taking place in the reign of Herod the Great. Second, he knows about the taxation under Quirinius because he quotes something from Gamaliel in Acts 5 that shows Gamaliel's awareness of it, and he's clearly referring there to the census under Quirinius. So any explanation we give for what is going on in Luke 2.2 has got to come to terms with these two facts about what Luke already knows. Any explanation that flies in the face of that doesn't fly. There are two possible answers. I will tell you which one I think is right, but many good scholars think the other one is right. And this is one of those cases where, speaking as historians, we cannot be absolutely certain. So I'm going to give them both to you. Answer number one, it, Quirinius may have had two periods as a governor of some sort in Syria. If so, Luke could be referring to the earlier period. That is possible. We'll discuss that in a minute. Second explanation, the Greek in this text does not actually claim that the well-known taxation under Quirinius took place in 6 BC. We'll look at that one after we're done with the first one. So first, to the first possible answer. We know that there was a fellow named Quintilius Varus, who was the governor of Syria from about 6 to 4 BC. Before him, and right before him, a fellow named Saturninus was governor. So if Quirinius was governor in Syria at the time when Jesus was born, then he was not the only governor. He was there as some kind of extraordinary legate of Caesar. And Caesar did send people out in that extraordinary capacity. With respect to Saturninus, there was a fellow named Volumnius whom Josephus calls governor. He speaks of the two of them in the same sentence as governors 
of Syria, even though only one of them was the Senate-appointed governor. So the term governor could be stretched. We'll come back to the flexibility of that term as we look at a later objection. So it is possible that Quirinius was a governor on special mission from Caesar at that time and in that area. It would have fit with the need to keep an eye on Varus. Varus was notoriously cruel and incompetent. More than a decade later, he was the military leader responsible for losing the Roman legions in the Battle of Teutoburg Forest, causing Caesar Augustus to cry out, Varus, where are my legions? Augustus may already have had worries about him, and if he had, it wouldn't have been out of character for him to send a trusted man of military worth, which Quirinius already was, to keep an eye on things there personally for him. So that's possible. There's an inscription that was found at Tivoli describing somebody, we don't know who because the beginning is broken off, who being a legate of Augustus for the second time received Syria and Phoenicia. That might have been a reference to Quirinius, and if it were, that might indicate that he had been an imperial leg legate sometime in the B.C.s, earlier than A.D. 6. But the grammar of the inscription, if you took it strictly, indicates that this person's second time is his second time as an imperial legate, not his second time as the governor of Syria. So grammatically, it's not as helpful as it might have seemed. This explanation remains possible, but it doesn't have any direct support. The inscription's just not clear enough to give us a firm grip on it. So that explanation remains possible, not as well supported as some people have claimed that it is. But let's look at the Greek a little bit more closely. There's a word in the Greek that can be read one of two ways. And since the earliest manuscripts were all done in capital letters, the two would look the same. One would be haute, this, and one would be aute, which is a reflexive. That would mean itself. Now, quite a number of scholars think that we should read it that way. In our lowercase manuscripts, where the accent marks and breathing marks have been written in later, the people who transcribed those chose to render it one way, but it, it had to be a guess from the Uncial manuscripts, the capital letter manuscripts. In your handout, I've shown you how it would look. It would be the identical set of four Greek capital letters for either word. If we read it that way, then here's how it would read. The apographe itself, and we'll come back to what that apographe means, was first made, etc. Now, the term apographe is a really interesting word. It means not a taxing necessarily. It could mean that but a registration, an enrollment, a signing up. The graphe part is where we get autograph also, right, your, your signature. So the apographe means in the first instance a, res, a registration. And then more generally, it can mean a taxation involving a registration. So there's a kind of metonymy going on, the part for the whole. The part is the signing up, sign up, register, and then the whole thing comes to be known by the same word. So an admissible reading of Luke's Greek here is that Quirinius picked up where the matter was dropped in 6 BC when Herod got back into Caesar's good graces and brought the taxation itself to pass. That would require that Luke use a certain verb a certain way, and it turns out that he does. He uses the verb agenata this way in Acts 11.28, where there's been the prophecy of the famine, and then he says, and this came to pass during the reign of Claudius. He uses the same verb there that he uses here, which is being rendered, was first made in this translation. Now, what are the consequences of this reading? First of all, Luke's passing mention of the apographe in the time of Judas the Galilean in Acts 537, doesn't have to be explained away. He knew that that one was the one under Quirinius. No problems. Second, his brief reference to the registration fits together with what Josephus says about an oath of allegiance to Caesar. So that dovetails with what Josephus says. We could wish for more, but what we have fits together. Third, there's no need to predate 
the governorship of Quirinius to 6 BC. So all of the apparent chronological discrepancies disappear. So we have two possible responses to objection number two. It may be that Quirinius had an official role in Syria, both around 6 BC and around AD 6. More probably, though, in my estimation, Luke intends to convey that although the census was aborted in 6 BC, it was picked up and carried through to its logical completion, the taxation itself under Quirinius in AD 6. Objection number three. Here's the text from Luke 3.1. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and now the critics cry halt. Luke uses the wrong term. Pilate was technically a prefect, nomarches, not simply a governor, hegemon. Well, it's true that the term Luke uses is not the technical term for prefect. And before the year 44, the governor of Judea was technically a prefect. After that time, we have inscriptional evidence that he was referred to as a procurator and hegemon would be a perfectly reasonable word to use then. But the more general term that Luke uses is also the common term. Let's check it out. Who are our best sources outside of the Bible for the first century? We've got Josephus and we've got Tacitus. Josephus repeatedly describes Pontius Pilate himself and his predecessors in that role by the term hegemon the same term that Luke uses. It's a generic term. It means governor, guy in charge, leader. Tacitus, the Roman historian writing in Latin, actually uses the Latin term for one of our procurators instead of calling him one of our prefects. This has caused skeptics to pull some of their hair out. What do you do when our two best sources for the first century use the same word that Luke uses, and you want to say Luke made a mistake. Well, that's okay. Everybody made a mistake. They were all wrong. They didn't know that century as well as we know it. Really? You think? We, we have a problem here, a methodological problem. When you get to the point where you've got to throw away all of your best evidence about a period of time, in order to make your pet theory stick, it's time to reconsider your allegiance to your pet theory. Let's move on to another objection quickly before that gets too embarrassing. Luke 3, 1 again. We'll stick in the same verse. And Herod, being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Eturia, and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene. Stop! According to Josephus, Lysanias was tetrarch of Abila, or Chalcis, as it's sometimes called, back around the year 36 BC. This is 60 years too early. That's a huge blunder. You can't have this being in the 15th reign of the year of the reign of Tiberius and have it be while Lysanias is tetrarch of Abilene. That's just way out. That, that, that would be like almost like talking about Abraham Lincoln and the beginning of World War II in the same breath. It just doesn't work. Okay, let's stop. There's a name, Lysanias, and there's a place, Abila or Abilene. The fact that those two terms occur together doesn't mean that the one mentioned by Luke and the one mentioned by Josephus are the same person. You say, that sounds lame. That's a cop-out. Come on, it's the same name. It's the same place. Ah, but... I call archaeology to witness in my favor here. There's an inscription found on a temple in Abila from the time of Tiberius, and it names a Lysanias as the tetrarch of Abila, just as Luke wrote. Hey, what's going on there? Well, maybe the guy who wrote the inscription also got it wrong by 60 years. Hold it. We already said we're not going to throw out first century data just because it doesn't fit the criticism, right? Criticisms also have to be critiqued. They have to stand on their own merits. How do we know that that's what the inscription means? Well, here's how it reads. For the salvation of the august lords, note that phrase, and of all their household, Nymphaeus, freedman of eagle Lysanias, tetrarch, established this street and other things. So this is from the inscription. 
What does that phrase, the august lords, tell us? Well, that was a joint title. It was only ever given to the emperor Tiberius and Livia, the widow of his predecessor, Augustus. They were known jointly after Augustus' death as the august lords. That establishes the date of the inscription. Augustus died in 14, so it can't have been before then because they didn't have the title then. Livia died in 29, so it can't have been after 29, or it wouldn't be for, as he says, the salvation of the august lords and their household. So there was a different Lysanias who was Tetrarch of Abilene right in the time Luke indicates because Luke's talking about the year A.D. 27, or right around there, give it a wiggle room of a year or so either way. We can talk about how those dates get established if you're interested. So we've got archaeological evidence backing up Luke's casual passing mention to a Lysanias Tetrarch of Abilene right at the right time period. Maybe somebody related to a previous Tetrarch of Abilene. We don't have a complete list of them that we could check it against and say, no, he can't. This other guy was Tetrarch of Abilene at that time. So we have corroborating evidence for Luke. Anybody who wants to claim this is a mistake has to do more than say, well, it sounds sort of similar to the thing that Josephus said, only at 60 years wrong, so Luke must have made a mistake. Why does Luke have to have made a mistake here? We know of a Lysanias who was Tetrarch during a time period. Objection number five, just moving on into the next verse. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. Well, one of the critics of the New Testament from the 19th century was Robert Taylor. He was a minister turned skeptic. He was crazy. His official position was that Jesus never existed. Right. That's about as sane as it sounds. There are still people today who try to maintain this position. I'll show you a picture of one a little bit later on. Here's what he said. Any person being acquainted with history and polity of the Jews must have known that there never was but one high priest at a time. And you know what? He's right. Look it up in Deuteronomy. High priest gets appointed, and he's high priest for life. So this is not like the Supreme Court where we can have nine justices sitting there. One guy. Okay, well, what's going on with that? Annas, who's sometimes called Ananus, had held the office of high priest from the year 6 to the year 15. But then one of the previous hegemones, Pontius Pilate's predecessor, Valerius Gratus, deposed him. And in fact, Gratus is really, he, he really loved to play with the system. He successively appointed and deposed a whole bunch of high priests. It was a game to him. Just, yeah, no, nah, I don't like him anymore. Put another one in. Imagine being a devout Jew, right? Who instituted the office of the high priest? Hint, it wasn't a Roman. It was God, right? How do you like having the Romans come and tell you who your high priest is? Not very much. What would you be tempted to say? They may appoint so-and-so, but Annas is still the high priest because he's been appointed by God, and we don't mess with that. And it seems that that's the way that the Jewish people generally felt because Josephus himself, who was a Pharisee and a priest born in Jerusalem before the destruction of Jerusalem, he was born around the year 37, he uses the same language Unblushingly, he speaks of Jonathan and Ananias, the high priest. Now, that's a later era. That's after Annas is dead. But he speaks just artlessly of that. Why would that be? Well, when Annas died, what happened? Somebody had to be put in for real as the high priest. It might or it might not be somebody the Romans approved of, but that really wouldn't matter because you're talking about the succession ordained by God. However... When it came time to do any public formal outward ceremonies, the Romans were watching. And so they apparently engineered a little bit of a trade-off. Whoever's appointed by the Romans puts on the robes, goes out, does the thing. But the real guy is still, everybody knows who he is. He still has authority. He's still somebody that you have to run things past. You can't get around him. In fact, Annas had 
five sons or sons-in-law appointed as high priest. And he was the hand behind the throne, the robe of spirit, if you will, behind the high priesthood. He was the guy who actually managed temple affairs through his sons and his sons-in-law. So he was a very powerful figure. Objection number six. Some of you heard one of my earlier lectures where I did this, uh, but I think that it's worth doing again. There's a passage in Luke 7 that's really interesting. I'm just going to go ahead and read it to you so you get the feeling for the way it unfolds. After Jesus had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. This is situated on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. Now, a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And they, these Jewish elders, came to Jesus, and they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, he, that would be the centurion, is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. Be like, you're coming to someone who's very wealthy and saying, oh, this, this person needs your help, and, and he's a good guy, and in fact, he built our church for us, which would be a fairly significant investment. Well, here's the objection. The fellow that you see here on the right is Robert M. Price, who is persuaded that this is all a bunch of hokum. A major collision, he says, between the gospel tradition and archaeology concerns the existence of synagogues and Pharisees in pre-70 Galilee. Historical logic implies that there would not have been any since Pharisees fled to Galilee only after the fall of Jerusalem. Imagine this guy as one of your kid's professors. How's that going to come across? Sounds pretty confident, doesn't he? Invoking archaeology, talking about historical logic, makes a good impression at first. Think about the implications of Luke 7. Luke's language suggests that the synagogue at Capernaum was a particularly impressive structure that required considerable funds to construct. That's why pointing to this synagogue is not just a little hole in the wall synagogue. This is a nice one, and he did this for us. Other passages in the Gospels make it plain that Capernaum was Jesus' principal base of operations in Galilee. He's always coming to Capernaum. Peter lived there. That's where Jesus, coming straight out of the synagogue, healed Peter's mother-in-law. So, if there wasn't any synagogue there, then all of the gospel authors are in trouble. So, have they been caught in a huge mistake? Well, let's check on what the archaeologists actually say instead of what people say they say. Quote, the first century Capernaum synagogue in which Jesus preached has probably been found. Because more than one synagogue may have existed in Capernaum at this time, we cannot be sure that this new find was Jesus' synagogue, but this recently discovered first century building is certainly a likely candidate. The conclusion that this was a first century A.D. synagogue seems inescapable. That's James Strange and Herschel Shanks in the Biblical Archaeology Review, Volume 9 from 1983, which predates Robert M. Price's book, which is 20 years after that, so Price has little excuse for his statement. But those are just words, and pictures are better, so let's have a picture. Here is a picture of one of the trenches in the excavation at Capernaum. What you see by the letter A there is a limestone wall. That's a 4th or 5th century synagogue wall. However, beneath the limestone wall is a basalt wall that runs off in the same direction and that basalt wall is from the first century. How do you tell whether something's from the first century? Especially building structure. I'll tell you how you tell. This is, this is kind of cool. We had some guys come in and do some work on a little planter that we've got. We've got a stone planter around the end of our house. And unfortunately, it's not anchored in. And so the stone was leaning and cracking. And we had to get it all fixed up. One of the things they had to do was to dig all the dirt out of there, and then they installed a little system for bracketing it back to the house, and then they put the dirt back in. 
In the middle of the time that they were doing that, the workmen, we, we saw them out, they were out there, they had made a huge pile of dirt on our lawn, and they were eating lunch. So they had stuff from Wendy's, you know, the cups and stuff. And where do you think that went when they were done? <laughs> I'll give you a hint. They didn't come knock politely on the door and say, is there a place where waxed cups can be recycled? That was not their reaction. Now, they threw them right into the area, and then they shoveled the dirt over on top of them. That's how they do it. Now, we can find coins with dates stamped on them in places like that. You find all kinds of interesting debris in a construction site. That's how they date these things. And then there's the cobbled pavement of the first century synagogue visible down below. That's where the letter C is. So, the walls of a first century synagogue at Capernaum have been discovered. They are unusually thick, and its floor plan shows that this is about half again as large as any other synagogue we found in Galilee. In other words, this is a notably nice, large synagogue. And think back to Luke 7, right? What do the Jews come and say to Jesus? Oh, he's worthy because he loves our people and he's built us this synagogue and it all fits together. Can I quote Charles Darwin? Is that okay? It's a good quotation. False facts are injurious things. A false theory will quickly be tested and discarded, but false facts will be allowed to pass without being checked. That's a problem. We can't build our view of the Scriptures on false facts. Objection number seven. In Luke 17, we read that on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. Now, here's the deal. Samaria lies between Galilee and and Judea, and Jerusalem's down in Judea. So, why would Jesus pass along between them, apparently meaning along the border, we'll get to that in a minute, in order to get to Jerusalem, right? If you hop on a bus for Grand Rapids and you find yourself in Detroit, something went wrong. You went 90 degrees the wrong direction. So, what's going on with that? Now, here's something really strange. I was reading in the Anchor Bible Commentary because I like to check sort of a, a mainstream commentary whenever I'm doing these talks in order to see what the consensus position is, or at least was at the time the volume was written. So I was reading in Joseph Fitzmyers' uh, volume on Luke. It's a two-volume commentary on Luke, and Fitzmyer, certainly no friend to traditional Christianity. So he quotes this phrase, between Samaria and Galilee, and then he says, this phrase enshrines Luke's geographical ineptitude. Well, that doesn't sound very complimentary. And then in the very same sentence, he keeps on going, and he says, and it is not easy to explain what is meant here. So I have a question. This is just a sort of naive question. If you don't even know for sure what Luke means, then how can it be so clear that he's making a mistake? Does that just seem like something maybe doesn't quite compute? We should figure out first what we think he means and then figure out whether we think it's a mistake. But he seems to have decided that it's a mistake and spends the rest of his time wondering about what it means. I just, I have a backwards reaction to that. That just doesn't seem right. Okay, but let's assume that it means that Jesus is traveling along a roughly east-west line, whereas to get from Galilee to Jerusalem, he'd have to travel from north to south. Okay, so why might Jesus have avoided Samaria? On this map, Galilee is near the top around the Sea of Galilee. Samaria is in the middle. Judea is at the bottom. You can see the little dot for Jerusalem right near the northern end of the Dead Sea, just west of it. Well, here are some reasons. First, the Samaritans were actively hostile to the Jews. In fact, in the year 52, Samaritans killed some Jewish pilgrims from Galilee, and that set off no end of trouble. The Jews asked the Roman governor at the time to take care of the matter. He didn't seem to be moving fast enough. Some of the Jews decided to take it into their own hands. They went and started rampaging around Samaria, killing Samaritans. The Roman governor took action then. He caught a bunch of Jews and crucified them. The whole thing was an incredible mess. But the Samaritans 
disliked the Jews. Why? Well, the Jews said there's only one place to worship God, and that is in the temple at Jerusalem. But the ancestors of the Samaritans had settled and set up their own place of worship in Mount Gerizim in Samaria. So when they saw that somebody was headed down to Jerusalem, they took that like a slap in the face. You're telling us our worship isn't the worship approved of by God. In fact, we even find elsewhere in Luke that Jesus is at one point intending to go through Samaria and some Samaritans refuse to welcome him. They don't offer that Middle Eastern hospitality, which is so common, because they can tell that he intends to go to Jerusalem. They could see the expression is that his face was set to go to Jerusalem, and so they wouldn't receive him. So traveling along the border from west to east would be one way of avoiding having to wrangle with the Samaritans. It would also, and this is a non-negligible point, keep Jesus and his disciples near fresh water. We don't worry about this much because we don't do a whole lot of walking in barren, arid, rocky terrain. But if you're going even on the Jesus Trail around the Lake of Galilee, you get told how many liters of water you need to have for each leg of the trip. They're very careful about that. Tourism is big business in Israel, and they don't want the tourists dying. So you're told to carry your water. Of course, that's fine, right? You just buy the bottled water or fill up your canteen or whatever. But if you're working in an age without bottled water, you will find it handy to move as nearly as you can along the rivers. And I've put in in blue along a border here, one of the little dot, dotted lines reaching over to the Jordan. That would have kept them near water for the leg over that direction. Then they can come down the Jordan River Valley, easier walking to beside the Jordan, and the Jordan is fresh water itself. It dumps into the Dead Sea in the south. The Dead Sea is not fresh water, but the Jordan itself is. So that would have kept them near water for the trip down. So it would have been a perfectly reasonable route for them to take. All right, that was seven shots at Luke. Let's take a couple of whacks at John. In the case of Luke, we've got so many references that we have lots of places to go. In the case of John, it's harder to find places where you can say, oh, John has messed up historically. There's more to be said in terms of apparent inconsistencies between John and the first three Gospels. We'll talk about those in a later lecture, but John, there really offers only two hooks here. Here they are. First one is the claim John gets the location of Bethany wrong. He puts it to the east of the Jordan, but it's on the west side of the Jordan. While I'm near here, let me just go back to that map. You see where Jerusalem is? west of the top end of the Dead Sea. Those of you who can't read the tiny print here. It's right there. Okay? Now just a couple of miles east of that is Bethany on the eastern slopes of Mount of Olives. So John, the claim is, gets the location of Bethany wrong by saying it's all the way over across the Jordan River. Second, the objection is, John's description of the relations between Jews and Christians is anachronistic. Christians were not expelled from Jewish synagogues until around the year 90, and that's two generations after Jesus lived. So we'll look at those. First, here's John's phrase. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. So the objection is, Bethany's not across the Jordan. What went wrong? Well... John's description is perfectly clear. He's referring to a Bethany beyond Jordan, Transjordan. Was there a Bethany there? Here's the evidence against it. 200 years later, the church father Origen made a trip to Palestine, and he hunted around, and he tried to find as many of the sites named in the Gospels as he could, and he found some of them, and he didn't find others. And that's all. Bethany Transjordan was one of the ones he couldn't find 200 years later. What if we were reading a description from the War of 1812 and we said, hey, let's hop in a car and see how many of the little towns and hamlets mentioned here we could find. We'd find some of them. And we wouldn't find others. And would it mean the ones we couldn't find had never existed? No, of course not. So this really doesn't provide a reason for doubting the accuracy of John's reference. In fact, 
since he already refers to the Bethany that's just a couple of miles away from Jerusalem, he seems to be drawing our attention to the fact this is a different one by saying this is Bethany beyond or across Jordan. He seems to be describing it in a way designed to draw our attention to it so we won't make a mistake in reading him thinking he's talking about Bethany on the Mount of Olives. So I don't think that one's got much traction. Objection number two is a very curious one. Do you remember the story of the blind man, born blind, whom Jesus heals? There's a hilarious scene. By the way, if you haven't read John 9 recently, just go home and pull out a Bible and read it. It's got the ring of truth. It's so true to life. The leaders of the synagogue are just confounded. And so they they call the blind man and they say, what did he do? And he says, well, he made clay and he put it on my eyes and he told me to go wash in the pool and I did and I can see. They're not very happy with that answer. Then they call him back. Tell us what he did. Uh, He anointed my eyes and told me to wash and I did and I can see. They don't like that answer. So they call his parents. And his parents are afraid of being kicked out of the synagogue. That's what this verse is about. His parents say, oh, he's of age. Ask him. Of course, they already did ask him twice. He's of age. Ask him. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. The Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. So, They call the blind guy again, or the erstwhile blind guy, and they say, what did he do? I already told you what he did. Do you want to become his disciples too? The guy's had enough, right? Well, give God the glory. We know this man's a sinner. And he said, well, that's really curious. You say he's a sinner. But he he opened my eyes. What have you done lately? Uh, just, just a fantastic scene. I love this scene. It is my second favorite scene in all of the Gospels. My favorite scene is the beginning of John 20, but this one is a runner-up. This is just awesome. Okay, but we have a record of a Jewish exclusion of Christians from the synagogues, or at least something that sort of amounts to that, around the year 90. So... That would be 60 years later. These 60-year gaps seem to be coming up a lot here, right? 60 years off. Well, what's, what's up with that? Here's what actually happened. According to Jewish tradition, sometime around the year 90, Jewish leaders modified one of their congregational prayers. What they did was they added an anathema on Nazarenes and heretics. And it's commonly thought that the Nazarenes referred to here are Christians, followers of Jesus of Nazareth. So if you were in the synagogue, you were supposed to be participating in corporate prayer. But if you were a Christian in the synagogue and you come to the line about the anathema on Nazarenes and heretics, what do you do? You're not going to anathematize yourself, say, oh, let me be, you know, as one cut off. No, you'll fall silent. Ah, but then they've got you. They'll know who you are because it's been added to the prayer and you're not saying it. Okay, maybe that was the intention. But there's no reason to take John 9.22 as referring to this later modification of the prayer. We get a difficulty here only if we assume that John and the Jewish sources are referring to the same event. Let's just compare them side by side briefly. John's report. It's a deliberate decision. They decided to cast these people out of the synagogue. Which people? Those who believe Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah. When did it happen? Sometime around the year 30 AD. The Jewish anathema, on the other hand, isn't a deliberate decision to throw people out. It's a modification of the congregational prayer. It says nothing about the Messiah. It says nothing about Jesus. It's directed against Nazarenes and heretics. may mean the Christians, but it doesn't use the same language and doesn't focus on the same point John does. And it happened around the year 90. If these two things came up and neither of the sources was the Gospels. Nobody would say they have to be the same thing. But no chance to throw a stone at the Gospels ever gets missed by these guys. So they conflate the two events. And then they say, oh, now there's an error. We're just, 
looking at them as separate events solves the difficulty altogether. Okay, let's just review very quickly where we've been. Caesar Augustus and the registration, probably a regional registration caused by Herod's falling out with Caesar. Quirinius and that same registration, probably Luke is contrasting the initial signing up with a later well-known taxation under Quirinius. Third, Pilate, prefect versus governor. Luke uses the same terminology as other writers. If I refer to someone as a congressman, and in fact he's a senator, I haven't made a mistake. I'm just using a more general, more widely applicable term. So the use of the general term is not a problem. Number four, Lysanias, Tetrarch of Abilene. We found him. We don't have to be guessing. We found somebody right in the time period described that way in the right place. Again, this conflation of two different people as the same and then the declaration on the basis of the conflating of the two that Luke must be wrong, that's the source of the problem. Annas and Caiaphas, high priests. Luke's usage conforms to Josephus' usage and Josephus helps us understand why the Jews would speak this way. So that makes perfect sense. The synagogue at Capernaum, objection killed by archaeology. Enough said. The geography of Palestine, Luke's description makes perfectly good sense, even if we do understand what it means. So it's very hard to see the objection there. How about the objections to John, location of Bethany? John's very explicit as designated this beyond Jordan. The most reasonable inference is that he's telling us it's a different one from the other one he also discusses that is manifestly right by Jerusalem. The exclusion of followers of Jesus from the synagogue, conflation again. No reason to think that John's remark has anything to do with the later modification of the Jewish congregational prayer. In these two lectures, the last one and this one, we've surveyed seven historical objections to Mark, three to Matthew, seven to Luke, and two to John. That's 19 objections overall. Not one of these objections has held up to investigation as an historical error on the part of the writer. And frequently, as we've seen, the objections arise from misreadings, conflation of distinct events and people, or the critics' inadequate knowledge of archaeology and geography. We've taken these objections from the writings of skeptics. I've found every one of these in books and articles by people who are critical of the Gospels. We have every reason to believe that they represent the best criticisms at their disposal. And you can have my word for it, though if you doubt me, please go ahead and look it up. I have done my best to comb through the literature and find the most plausible sounding objections that I can. I'm not trying to hide anything from you in this. I submit to you that we have every reason on purely historical grounds, without invoking theology, without talking about inspiration, just on historical grounds, we have every reason to consider the Gospels to be substantially trustworthy historical documents written by authors who were well-informed and habitually truthful. If you'd like more, I've got a website, historicalapologetics.org. I'd love for you to stop by, and my good friend, Brian Auten, who is responsible for putting these lectures up on YouTube, has a website, apologetics315.com, the 315 coming from 1 Peter 315, which you should read if you haven't got the reference memorized. And also, if you're on Facebook, you can like the Library of Historical Apologetics. We love to have you like us. Thank you. Pastor. The uh, perspective of these critics that uh, the Gospels are guilty until proven innocent yeah. just really isn't fair. And I, I just kind of wanted to point that out. I'm wondering if, for example, Josephus uh, is different than, say, Luke on a given point, why is the assumption always that Luke is wrong and Josephus is right? And does anybody ever question Josephus as to whether he had it wrong in some so, so the, the point that Pastor Nauman is making is that there seems to be a double standard. We'll take the word of a Jewish historian or a Roman historian, but we won't give the same credit to the gospel authors, and any time there's a conflict between them, it always seems the first assumption people make is, oh, the gospel writers had to get it wrong. Why do we make that assumption? And the answer is, I don't think we've got any very good reason for making that assumption. I think we've got a bad one. 
Think back to the things that we went through in the previous lecture, the alleged geographical blunders in Mark, the fact that Matthew makes use of Mark, and therefore, if Mark blundered, Matthew can't really have known what was going on because he's using a blundering source. If you pile up a bunch of those things, and then you say, therefore, we're going to take it as a settled fact that these guys are bunglers, don't know what they're doing, well, sure, then, if you get another credible historical source, anybody would be better than somebody who blunders repeatedly, right? The trouble is that when we go to look at these things in detail, the charge that these guys are incompetent just doesn't hold up. And it never held up. It was never well argued. A lot of these things got popular because they were raked together into one volume by David Friedrich Strauss in 1835 in his Life of Jesus. He was not a very original thinker, but he had ransacked the writings of infidels for the previous century and a half or so and put everything he could into one big, fat, indictment of the Gospels. For sheer size, it's kind of overwhelming. Here you've got nearly a thousand pages of critique of the Gospels, right? Surely some of that's got to stick. Well, there's only one way to find out, and that's to sit down and roll up your sleeves and read through all of Strauss's Leben Jesu and track down every single thing he says. It's not very pretty. I won't claim to have read every page of that work, but I've read far more than it would be good for anyone to read again. <laughs> and it's a disaster, a, a learned disaster, a kind of a monument to the misapplication of a mind that had the capacity to do something worthwhile. And so you, you erect a massive indictment, and then people shrug their shoulders and give up and say, okay, You've got a thousand-page book that says this. I'll give up. I'll, you know, I'll concede that you're right. Where do we go from here? Tell me where, what to think. That's not the way good historical scholarship is done. And I think that the Gospels have been relegated to this point. Well, why did Strauss do that? Why did he hate Christianity so much? There were probably personal reasons. But one thing he makes perfectly plain is that he thought modern thought had decided the issue that miracles can't happen. And in the Gospels, miracles get reported as facts. Ergo, the Gospels can't be true. Starting there and moving, well, once you start there, right, you've kind of killed the whole historical evaluation of the Gospels thing. It's been poisoned at the source at that point. They contain miracles. Miracles don't happen. How do you know that miracles don't happen? Hume proved it. In his new life of Jesus and in some other writings, he becomes more overt in his gestures towards Hume and even names Hume as the source of this. Well, now he's over-treading on my territory. I'm a philosopher, and Hume's critique is a piece of philosophy. And it's a funny thing. About a dozen years ago, a friend of mine, not a Christian, but a very fine philosopher of science named John Ehrman, took a good hard look at Hume's critique of miracles. Ehrman was not, and still is not, a Christian, or indeed a religious believer of any kind. But he got so frustrated with Hume's reasoning that he wrote a book called Hume's Abject Failure. Tell us, John, what do you really think of Hume? An abject failure, he said. His argument is a confection of rhetoric and shangeld. It's fool's gold. There's nothing there. And he got accused of being a Christian apologist because he was writing this book. He just said, no! I'm just trying to set the record straight. This is a bad argument. That bad argument is at the foundation of Strauss's critique of the Gospels. And Strauss's work has informed all subsequent mainstream biblical criticism. It was German, didn't you know? The Germans got it right. So, yeah, from that point on, it's been pretty much, um, we, we, we've been fighting against Strauss and the incursion of Strauss. So you're... You're right that it's, it's unfair, it's a double standard, and one of the things that I have found myself saying again and again, talking with people who are critical of the Gospels, is start out, just start out at the beginning, no double standards, okay? Whatever we would do with Tacitus or Josephus, we'll do that with the Gospels. If you will grant the same kind of consideration to the Gospels that you would grant to any other similarly credentialed historical source, then I will make the argument for historical trustworthiness without any appeal to inspiration. How about, is that a deal? And some of my skeptical friends have said, no, I won't. 
okay, which of us is being fair and approaching this with a spirit of open-minded inquiry? But some of them have said, okay. And I'm very glad to report that some of those have become Christians. It tends to do that when you look at the evidence with an open mind. Anyway, long-winded answer. Go ahead. Follow up, Pastor. No, that was awesome. I just one quick follow-up. Uh, these critics who are claiming that these first century Palestinian writers were so off on geography and uh, uh, that kind of thing, first century right. uh, information, where do they assume these guys came from or lived or at what century or what planet? I mean, how did they be so off? Oh, I don't know. The unknown guy who wrote Mark might have been from Rome and never visited Palestine. But it didn't really matter because he was constructing... I'm just giving you the line here. Because he was constructing a theological geography. What's that? That's a fancy word that means, well, yeah, I mean, on the face of it, it looks like he's writing a historical account. But we don't like what he says, so we'll find some negative description to give to it. But that, that's all that it means. There is nothing backing up that claim, as, as we all saw in the previous lecture. And the attempt to saddle Luke with a misconception about the location of Samaria just falls flat as well. That's, I, I find it difficult to understand why arguments like this have currency. In other philological fields, they would be laughed out of court. We wouldn't take a stray line from Tacitus or Josephus and say, oh, well, he must have committed an elementary blunder, been 60 years off on a date, or got the location of the major regions of Palestine completely confused. We would say, well, that's curious. I wonder what he meant here. Maybe he meant this. We'd give some plausible explanation, and we'd move on. We do this constantly with such other historians. That's why it's been my drumbeat in talking to my skeptical friends. No double standards. Use the same historical standards, and we can have a conversation, and I will let the evidence take it from there. But if you start out with a double standard, then I decline to play. I'm perfectly willing for you to put it to any fair test you've got. Do that. Bring it up. That's fine. But not a double standard that says, well, we're going to start off with these things as guilty until proven innocent. In other words, we're going to assume that what they say is false unless you can give me corroborating references from other sources. And sometimes we even can. But that's not a test to which we would put any other historical author. Exactly. It's just the wrong way to do history. Any other questions? Yes? If you went to Jerusalem or some of those places like that, why could you not find some of the landmarks? Why could you only find some? So, so the question is, if you were to go to Jerusalem... Why would it be that you couldn't find everything that is mentioned? And the answer is it depends on when you went. Here's what you need to understand. Remember, all of the stuff that we read in the Gospels takes place in a three-year period. My best guess is it's between the year 27 and the year 30. Some people would move that up and say it's between 30 and 33. But it's, it's right in that range. And we know it can't have been much later because... A little bit after that time, Pontius Pilate got called back to Rome, and he wasn't in charge in Palestine anymore. So it all had to happen before he left, and that was in the 30s, right? In the years 66 to 70 AD, okay, so move forward 35, 40 years later, there was a war between the Jews and the Romans. At the end of that war, the Romans destroyed all of Jerusalem except for one wall, which they left standing. And Josephus, who was involved in that war, he tells us, apart from that wall, they destroyed it so thoroughly that you couldn't even tell anyone had ever lived there. Also, they were ruined. So they ruined Jerusalem. Now, some of the other places, you know, across the Jordan, might still have been there and not have suffered much during that war. But then you get the other thing, which is hundreds of years passed before Origen tried to go over and find things. In hundreds of years, you know, maybe there's a town that's situated by a well or by a spring, and the spring runs dry. Time to pack up and move to some place where there's better water. 
maybe things just, you know, maybe one of the trade routes is getting more business and it just, you can sell your fish better up there so you move and more people move and eventually the little town becomes abandoned and it falls apart because nobody's there to take care of it, you know, storms damage the houses and things fall down and people cart off whatever stone they can that they need for building other things and it just, it's gone. And wild animals live there. So these are some of the things that can happen over the course of a lot of time. War and just sight shift people leaving places and moving on to new places. Um, when I was a boy growing up in Pennsylvania, I lived for a while in a little house on Summit Lake Road and I loved to go out into the woods behind the house. There were just beautiful fields and then woods. And going back out, I knew how to go down one direction. There was a place where you could still see a few boards from an old outhouse, a toilet, out in the middle of the woods. Now, nobody makes a toilet in the middle of the woods for the fun of it, right? I think we'll go make a toilet out in the middle of the woods. That just, that's not the way it works. So there had to have been some other kind of building nearby for which this was the outdoor toilet. No trace of the other building, wherever it had gone. And it probably hadn't been 200 years. It had probably been maybe 100 years. But there were very few traces left of that. Uh, so that's, that happens. Things, buildings get abandoned. Sites get abandoned. People move elsewhere. Times change. You, uh, Origen found some of the places, but he didn't find others. Right, and people, maybe nobody even lived there anymore. So if you went to the places where the people were living, they might remember that there used to be something over there, or they, they might not. So it's time. Mostly it's just hundreds of years passing. And, and we're talking about a gap in time as great as the gap between us and the year 1812. That's so long ago that the British burned Washington, D.C. in 1812, and we've forgotten all about it. I've never spoken to anybody who knew anything about that. So that's how it happens, that we lose you know, track of some sites, they get forgotten, others get remembered, that's how it goes. Good question. Yes? Has anybody ever tried to um, tie some of the historical components to the weather patterns? Okay, does anyone tie historical components to weather patterns? There is some work on that, and uh, there has been some weather shift, particularly in Egypt, I believe, over the course of, you know, from the beginning of biblical history until now. I am not an expert in that. I have seen some references to it. They looked good as far as I could tell, but I haven't had the opportunity to check them out. One thing I was interested in was the question of water levels in the Sea of Galilee. They have fluctuated a little bit. It looks like the average water level now in the Sea of Galilee is uh, a little different from what it was in Jesus' time. I'm trying to remember. You would ask the question, and I get into this, and Try to remember, uh, I think these days it's a little higher, but I could be wrong, I could be the other way around. But it's not wildly different. I was looking into this for the previous lecture when I was thinking about the question of the location of Gadara or Karsa, whatever the name was, Karasa, Karsa, and the swine. And I, I wanted to know, well, if they were running down into the lake, would it make a difference how big the lake was? And there's one site that will work at current levels or at previous levels, either way. More questions. Mark? Is there, is there anybody, like historians, who just gave up on doing it their way and they used the Bible, like any good stories, and then they found what they were looking for? So the question is, did, did any historians start out with a preconception against Scripture and then discover that it was actually getting it right and changed their mind? And the answer is yes. There's a wonderful story of a young man named Sir William Ramsey. There's a end of the 19th century, uh, historian, archaeologist, who early in his career absorbed the critical views of the Tübingen school of Germans, which, ah, the Gospels were late forgeries, none of them had been written by the people whose names they bore, they were fanciful, they were this, they were that. And so he went to start his archaeological studies, persuaded that the Gospels and Acts were essentially works of fiction by clueless authors. And he changed his mind. And he, he, he talks about that. And he, he has an autobiographical essay in which he describes this. And he says, I started out with a presupposition against the rectitude of these authors. 
And then I discovered that time and again, what I was digging up was lining up with what they said. And I came around to the point where my most valuable possession was my Bible as I was going out to do the digs. So he just did a total 180 on that, forced by the facts. And, and he, he was a kind of a hard-headed guy, um, a little bit arrogant, but certainly a brilliant uh, historian and scholar. And he single-handedly revived the reputation of Luke as a historian. And he's got several books in which he's done that. I would be happy to lend you some of those books if you're interested in that. Or I can give you PDF files of them. They're the kind of thing that we specialize in at the Library of Historical Apologetics. Yeah. Terry. Did, did you make that argument? Okay, let me try to restate the question here and, and then see if I can answer it. So the, the question starts out like this. We've got miracle reports in the Gospels, and one of the things that I've said is that I think a lot of negative criticism of the Gospels arises from an antipathy toward the miraculous. Just, oh, come on. You know, this is an age of science. We don't believe those fairy tales anymore. But as you're pointing out, there are works that claim miracles. I could mention, say, you know, the Book of Mormon, right? Where we are skeptical, and we're inclined to think we're rightly skeptical of the claims of these authors. Now, if we could just say, well, these were written far after the events, like the life of Apollonius of Tyana was written by someone writing over 100 years after Apollonius is supposed to have died. And, oh, well, he's not in a strong position to give us a biography, right? Then we might be able to dismiss them that way. But suppose that someone were to acknowledge that, yes, there is a pretty good case that these things were written by people who were on the spot, either the people whose names they bear or somebody else who really knew what was going on, then the critique might be rephrased. The critic might say, well, okay, I'll grant you they were written by those people and they got most of this stuff right, but not the miracle stuff. That's that stuff I'm just, I'm not going to buy into. And you wouldn't buy into it either if it were Joseph Smith trying to sell it to you, so why should I buy in, into it here? Is, is that the sort of question you want me to address? Okay. Here's what I would say. First of all, let's have a good solid look at how much evidence there is or isn't for the proposed record. So if you're going to talk to me about the Gospel of Thomas, then I would like to point something out. I've done a lot of work showing you little references to places, you know, locations, it, you, the very sort of tacked on prepositions that are built into Greek verbs, right? Where does Jesus go when he's at the wedding at Cana and then he goes to the Sea of Galilee? He goes down. Downhill, literally downhill, and we can check these things out, right? A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Absolutely right, it's downhill. If the author had said he went up to Jericho, you could spot a fraud right away, okay? So these little things, lots and lots and lots of place references, Bethany beyond the Jordan, crossing the brook Kidron on their way to Gethsemane, all kinds of little place names and, and details of this sort. Now, go to the Gospel of Thomas. You have to read 60 dull verses before you get any mention of any place at all. And it's Jerusalem. A man was going to Jerusalem carrying a sheep. And that's it. You, there's none of this integration, this wealth, this almost cornucopia of, of detailed knowledge where more than is even needed that you find in somebody like Mark or Luke or John. There is nothing like that. It's a series of statements, some of them just cribbed from our canonical gospels, some of them made up by the Gnostics, strung together like separate little beads on a string. Jesus said this. Jesus said that. Peter asked this. Jesus replied that. Jesus said this. Jesus said this other thing. They're just strung together. There's no narrative connection. There's no locale. There's nothing to give you that feeling of integrated, authentic history that you find in the Gospels. So some of these documents, besides bearing on their face, their origins, one of the Gnostic Gospels has Peter coming to Jesus and saying, Lord, tell us about, and then he names some Gnostic terminology, like the aeons. Right. I'm sure that was a hot topic in taverns all around the Sea of Galilee. Tell us about the aeons. It has nothing to do with anything Jewish. It's a 
response to convention. The work bears testimony to its origins and its purpose, even in the very things that it puts into the mouth, supposedly, of Jesus' disciples. Furthermore, we know that there's no record of any citation of or use of these works until down late in the second century for most of these things. They just were not a big hit. They weren't taken seriously for the very good reason that everybody knew they had nothing apostolic about them. They hadn't been written by an apostle. They hadn't by written, been written by somebody who was a companion of the apostles. It's not just that the teaching isn't convincing. It's also that they had no credentials. When Marcion took a copy of the Gospel of Luke and trimmed out the Jewish parts because he was a rabid anti-Semite and published it as a gospel, one of the things he got ripped for by Tertullian was putting something out there supposedly as a gospel without its name on it. What does that tell you about copies of the gospel that were circulating that Tertullian knew about? They had names on them. These were not documents that circulated anonymously, leaving people to guess who they were written by. Everybody knew who had written these things. So the first thing to say is that there is no comparable critical challenge on sheer historical grounds of being written close to the events by somebody who lived at the time and knew wherever he spoke. And we can tell that just by analyzing the documents. Paul Meyer said to me, he's taught a comparative religion course a couple of times. And of course, some of you know Paul, my, my esteemed colleague, now retired, taught ancient history for 50 years at Western Michigan University. Nobody else has ever taught for that long. I aim to outdo his record. We'll see how I do on that. 17 years in and going. Only got 34 more to go. Um, but he said to me, I don't like to do it. I don't like to teach comparative religion. I said, that, that's interesting. Tell me about that. He said, you know, the reason is because you have to talk about Christianity alongside of these other things, and there's just no comparison historically. We're not even playing in the same league. The evidence for Christianity is so far and away better than the evidence for these other things that it's just crazy. They should, we shouldn't even be discussing Christianity in the same course for these other things. I love Paul. He's, he's great. So... That would be the first line of response. The evidence is just better, way better, for the historical books of the New Testament. Still, the objector can say, well, you know, even so, even if I had a document that seemed to be written by a reputable authority, you know, Herodotus is a pretty decent historian, but he tells me about all these prodigies and stuff that happen. I read through it and I sort of mentally discount those things, but I, I think that what he tells me about somebody like Cyrus, I'm likely to believe, so why can't I make a similar separation in the Gospels? Separate out the miraculous stuff, believe the rest of it. And here there are two answers that I would like to give just briefly, and we can discuss this more later. The first answer would be this. In some places, the miraculous events and the rest of the narrative are so tightly woven together that you can't pull them apart. All of the undesigned coincidences surrounding the feeding of the 5,000, for example, make no sense if there was no miracle there. But they're just layer upon layer upon layer of these things. You can't pull them apart. Either the whole thing's a fabrication, or it pretty much happened as it's being told. There's not really much in the way of a middle ground there. Um, the scene beside the Sea of Galilee in John 21, where Jesus is gently rebuking Peter, saying, Peter, do you love me more than these? The rationale for that becomes clear only in an account of what happened at the Last Supper that has more information than John's account in John 13 and following contains. So you have to go back to the other Gospels. There. There's something actually happened, really happened behind that. But Jesus can't be beside the Sea of Galilee after his crucifixion unless he rose again. So that presupposes a miracle the very way it's put together. So that's one of the things. The way that these are woven in, they're not just separable. You can't pick them out like a picky kid picking the raisins out of his raisin bread because he doesn't like raisins. You can't separate them that easily. It's, it would be more like trying to get the flour out of your raisin bread. It just can't be done. The second thing that I would say is that it's not simply on the testimony of the gospel authors that we believe these things. It's also on what we know about the behavior of the first proclaimers of the gospel. And what we know is that they endured labors and dangers and sufferings 
voluntarily in attestation of their accounts. And remember, what was the criterion for somebody becoming one of the apostles? They had to fill up the twelve because Judas had betrayed Jesus and gone out and hanged himself. How do they fill that out? We need to find somebody who, Acts chapter 1, what are the criteria? Somebody who's been a witness of these things and with us from the beginning. Okay, And they had their choice. They debated it for a while. They narrowed it all the way down to two people. They cast lots. Matthias got chosen. There was a choice of people to do that. And then what did they do? These people who had been denying their Lord when he was captured, who had been hiding with locked doors for fear of the Jews, became bold proclaimers of the risen Christ. Read Acts 2, Acts 3, Acts 4, Acts 5, just sermon after sermon after sermon. And they're out there boldly stating, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now where are they saying it? Calcutta? No. They haven't run far away and said, oh, you know, somewhere way, way back, far away where you can't go right now, there was a miracle. Believe us. No, no, no. They're saying that right in their faces, ground zero, in Jerusalem, 40 days after the event, this is what happened. Now, people who do that are either right or wrong. If they're right, case closed. If they're wrong, either they know that they're wrong, and so they're deliberately saying something they know is false, or they don't, in which case they're duped into saying it. Now, there are a lot of things you can be duped into saying. The golden plates of Joseph Smith. Uh, I've got an account from one of his brothers about how they saw them, and there are some similar accounts elsewhere as well. So, uh, did, did you see the plates? Well, no, I saw a box. Well, how did you know the plates were in the box? Well, there, were, there was a boy's frock over the top, but I, you could sort of feel through it. You could feel that they were there, but I wasn't allowed to remove the frock. I asked, but we were told, no, we can't. We, you're not allowed to do that. The angel Gabriel will smite me if you lift it. Anybody want to buy a bridge? I mean, <laughs> this is just... The, what, there are some people who put it all out there on the line, and there are other people who don't. And there is a qualitative difference in the kind of evidence. Now, if they know that it's false, then all of human history tells us people will tell lies, but only when there's something that they have to gain for it. Be that fame, or money, or sex, or drugs, or empire, some kind of human goal for telling a lie. Now, the first Christians endured much, stood to lose all of their standing in society because almost all of the first Christians were Jews, and to be a Christian was to be fundamentally in tension with your Jewish society, and in some places to be just kicked out altogether. So they were standing to lose everything that had held them together socially. From an earthly perspective, there was not much to gain. I will not say that such a life of hardships and new rules of conduct voluntarily undertaken is without its enjoyments. But I will say that the enjoyment springs from sincerity. If you know that what you are saying is false, then you're not going to do this. There's nothing to be gained. There's just nothing there. No other parallel miraculous claim stands up with that kind of evidence. None. I've poked my nose into every kind of mystic sect and cult from Mithra to Anana Ishtar to Epta. Covered the map looking at all of these things and with all of them it comes down to well, either you kind of get into this kind of thing or you don't. Christianity, Paul Meyer's right. Qualitatively, the evidence is so different that we shouldn't even be talking about the two in the same way. So that second line of it, not only don't their documents measure up to our documents, but the people who were, by their own profession, the first witnesses of the risen Christ, gave a testimony with their lives and in some cases with their blood that is unrivaled. You can get people to believe in an ideology. You can whip them up emotionally, but we're talking here about an empirical fact that all of them had to know whether it was true or false. I won't say anything about 
the second and third and fourth generations of the Christians. Their sufferings may be admirable, but they don't have the same evidential force here. But those original proclaimers, they anchor this down. There's a wonderful book by Brooke, book by, uh, Brooke Foss Westcott called The Gospel of the Resurrection, and that it, there's a new edition of that coming out that I've been working on for uh, DeWard Publications, and I would encourage you, you might want to read that. It's wonderful because Westcott has just put his finger on the pulse of the first Christians, and it gives a very clear portrait of what was going on there. It's a great question. I know that was a kind of a long answer, but it was a long question. <laughs> So the, the question is, will I do a talk comparing the evidence of the Christian miracles with the, those of other rival religions? I don't have a talk like that planned, but it's a great idea. So I'm going to think about that, and I may actually come back and, and impose upon people more and say, I have another talk to do. So I'm glad that you raised that. I will, I will seriously consider that. It would make a really good comparison, so, and there's a lot of material for it. When I was in college, I read uh, writings by Clement. Ignatius, yes. Other people. Yes. And you read that, it just sounds like Galatians and Ephesians. Yeah. They were not in the Bible because they were not directly connected with Christ. Is that what they were? They, they were not in the Bible because they were neither directly connected with Christ nor working under apostolic authority. Apostolic authority is the the most significant criterion of inclusion in the New Testament. And when you had people discussing whether or not something belonged in the New Testament, the question was always, does this have apostolic authority? So Clement is a generation on from the apostles. We have no indication that he wrote directly as somebody working under one of the apostles. And so he didn't make it, but he's a valuable witness to the existence of various parts of the New Testament. He quotes from Paul's letters. You can find uh, bits of things like that in Clement himself. Good letters. I mean, they have a lot of good stuff. Yeah, no, there's great stuff. I love um, the Epistle to Diognetus. It's, it's one of my favorite of the old works like that. It sounds like somebody had just thoroughly absorbed Paul. And it, you're reading it and you just say, is, it, is this Paul? But it's not. It, it's a fellow who just describes himself by the word methetes, disciple. And he's writing to Diognetus and telling him all these things. It's a wonderful, wonderful read. So yes, I love that old material. And uh, But the reason that it's not in Scripture is that there was no reason for thinking that it had apostolic warrant. It wasn't even so much a question of whether the doctrine was good or bad. There's good stuff in those things. It was, this doesn't have apostolic warrant behind it. Mark was not an apostle, but the tradition has it that he wrote down what he wrote from Peter's preaching. Peter's the authority behind it. Luke was the longtime associate of Paul, the beloved physician that we read about in Colossians. Luke's authority came from his long association with that last of the apostles, the one added as one born out of due time, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. So the question is, have I ever tried to get access to, say, the Vatican archives? I have not. My specialty is analytic philosophy. I'm a logician. I do philosophy of science. This, and I do the history of science, which is the connection over to this as a historian. But my own specialties actually lie elsewhere, and I, I read and write and publish on those as well. This is something that I'm doing because I think it's important and not enough people are doing it, and the information is not out there. But I make use of the work of people who do that kind of detailed work. I had the good fortune to be in Oxford in March with my dear friend Craig Keener, who is a professor at Asbury Theological Seminary, and Craig's a research nut. I mean, when he's around, I, I sit down and I just let him talk. He wrote a commentary on the book of Acts that was under contract with the publisher, and the publisher called him up and yelled at him because the manuscript that he turned in, when they printed it, would be 7,000 pages long. <laughs> he, he found another publisher who's actually publishing it. There is a God. <laughs> it's, it's just beautiful. But Craig is such, such a wonderful researcher. I use the work of people like that. And uh, he's read through, he, he doesn't borrow other people's footnotes. He just goes and he reads through the whole Loeb classical library and then makes his own notes from it. That's the kind of researcher he is. A person like this comes around every two or three centuries. Um, I, I give homage to those people. I read their works. I learn from them. But I am not that level of a specialist, and that's the level of a specialist you'd be talking about. So I can give you lots of works written by those people, though. Ask me, ask me. I will. I promise. 
More questions? All right, well, thank you guys very much for your patience and your time.